the man known to history as Henry of Monmouth and King Henry V of England was born on the 16th of September 1386 at Monmouth Castle in Wales, near the border with England. He was the eldest son of Henry of Bolingbroke, who became King Henry IV of England in 1399, when Henry of Monmouth was only 13 years old. His mother was Mary of Bowen, who came from an old aristocratic family with extensive landholdings in East Anglia and other parts of England. Mary and Henry of Bolingbroke were married on the 5th of February 1381 at Rochford Hall in Essex. Because she was only 11 years old at the time of their marriage, she remained with her mother for another four years. In 1385, Henry and Mary began to live together. It proved a good match, one based on mutual affection and a shared fondness for fine books and music. She gave birth to six children in eight years, Henry in 1386, Thomas in 1387, John in 1389, Humphrey in 1390, Blanche in 1392, and Philippa in 1394. Mary died prematurely in Peterborough Castle, giving birth to their last daughter, and was buried at the Church of St. Mary de Castro in Leicester. As a young man, Bolingbroke had proven himself to be a true cultured warrior of royal blood. He was well educated and could read and write English, French and Latin, and loved music and books. He excelled in jousting, participated in a crusade to Lithuania, went on pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and had learned from his father, John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, how to navigate the sometimes dangerous waters of court life. Since his father was Edward III's third son, his entire life was overshadowed by the question of the right to inherit the throne. He had been told as a young child that if the current King Richard II had no heirs, he stood to inherit the throne. Because of the threat the Lancastrian family posed to the autocratic and insecure Richard, both Bolingbroke and his first son, the future King Henry V, became pawns in a power struggle. After being exiled by the king in 1398 and his father's lands being confiscated after John of Gaunt died in 1399, Bolingbroke had to decide whether to remain in exile or reclaim his ancestral lands. When he arrived back in England in midsummer of 1399, thousands welcomed him with open arms, and this wave of support propelled him to depose Richard II and accept the throne. Some felt he usurped it. Such legal niceties aside, his reign proved a never-ending challenge due to the constant military threats from Wales, Scotland and France, and the numerous internal plots to depose him. Additionally, his inability to raise funds to combat these threats only made the situation worse. Finally, he was stricken with a mysterious illness in 1406 that slowly weakened him during the last years of his reign. Yet, during those later years, the overall situation improved as he and his advisors began to regain control over the kingdom's finances and both internal and external threats. This laid the groundwork for his son, Henry of Monmouth, to inherit a throne that rested on a more solid foundation. However, the question of his legitimate right to that throne remained. Henry of Monmouth entered the world at a time of political power struggles, not only within royal dynasties of England and France, but also within the Catholic Church. These clashes included one of the longest periods of conflict between France and England known to us as the Hundred Years' War, which erupted in 1337 and had been fought intermittently ever since. The roots of the conflict lay in the question of the right of English kings to control not only their ancestral lands in France, including the provinces of Normandy, Brittany, Gascony, Anjou and Aquitaine, but also to the French throne itself. 
For instance, the kings of England had held the Duchy of Normandy in northern France from the Norman conquest of 1066 through to the loss of this territory by King John to the French in the early 13th century. During the Hundred Years' War, English kings fought to reclaim these territories, only to be repelled again and again by French forces. At the time of Henry of Monmouth's birth, all that remained under English control was Gascony and a small sliver of land around the port city of Calais in the northeast of France. Increasingly, as large land holdings became consolidated under one ruler, leading to the birth of nation-states that lacked the outlet of military conquest, extended royal family members turned on themselves, as happened with the Richard II Lancastrian feud that clouded so much of Monmouth's young life. However, this feud paled in comparison to the infighting within the Valois Royal House of France. There, the King of France, Charles VI, suffered from intermittent insanity and royal family members vied to fill this power vacuum. As a result of this, a French civil war would begin in 1407 when John, Duke of Burgundy, also known as John the Fearless, assassinated his uncle Louis, Duke of Orléans. This would have major consequences for Henry in his later years as King of England. There were numerous other issues which obtained in England during the late 14th century which would lead to problems for Henry when he became king of the country years later. Many of these centered on religious affairs. In England in the 1370s, a church reformer by the name of John Wycliffe had begun demanding reforms and greater transparency within the church through the eradication of corrupt practices such as nepotism and simony, while the doctrine of the church as promulgated from Rome was also being called into question. The Lollards, as Wycliffe's followers became known after his death in 1384, were a major group within the English church throughout the 1390s and 1400s, and Henry would have to engage with them in years to come as a form of hereticism within the English church. In addition to this issue, there were growing problems around the financing of the English government and the country more widely. These two would have a significant bearing on Henry in his adult years. Henry of Monmouth grew up in his family's Lancastrian land surrounded by his extended family and their retainers. Henry learned much from these highly educated and culturally sophisticated people. He not only followed his father in learning to speak and write French, Latin and English, he also absorbed his parents' love of music, which included learning how to play the harp and sing. He became one of the first kings of England to regularly write his correspondence in English. Furthermore, he received intensive training in rhetoric and logic in line with the new form of humanist education, which was just beginning to become popular in Western Europe as the Italian Renaissance entered its most substantial period. By age eight, his education shifted to the military arts, where he became an expert equestrian, jouster, combat fighter, and military strategist. But in 1398, at age 12, the young Henry found his world turned upside down when King Richard exiled his father from England and took him, Henry himself, hostage in order to ensure his father's further good behavior. The taking of hostages in this way was a common medieval practice to control the behavior of people. But generally speaking, Richard is believed to have treated young Henry well. Disorienting events evolved quickly for Henry when his father returned to England as Henry's father took advantage of the dislike of Richard's reign within the political community of England to depose Richard and have himself crowned as King Henry IV of England, the first usurpation of the English crown which had occurred in well over 200 years. On the day of his father's coronation on the 13th of October 1399, Henry participated in the coronation ceremony. He had the honor to carry the sword of justice, 
and soon after this the young Henry became not only the Prince of Wales, but also Duke of Cornwall, Earl of Chester, Duke of Aquitaine, and Duke of Lancaster. It was through these estates that the young Henry received income to fund his household and it was his responsibility to oversee them. In addition, while he was only 13 years of age at this time, his father increasingly handed him significant responsibilities. This was seen in the case of the rebellion of Owen Glendur, a Welsh prince who had initiated a revolt against the English crown in 1400. This would drag on throughout Henry IV's reign, with the king having much the worse of the conflict between 1400 and 1406. The king decided in 1406, when his son was just 19 years of age, to place him directly in charge of the suppression of this rebellion in the Crown's western territories. It can be said that the man Henry of Monmouth became was forged during his time in Wales. He learned a myriad of lessons he would use throughout his life. One of the most important was the question of fiscal management. Henry's father's reign was blighted by issues around fiscal mismanagement and the young Prince of Wales began to understand from an early age that the way to succeed as king was to ensure that the Exchequer had more money coming in than out of it. This became extremely apparent in Wales during the mid-1400s when young Henry's forces had difficulties in terms of their supplies and activities owing to an insufficient flow of money from London. Consequently, Henry found himself writing on several occasions during these years to his father begging for more money. He learned that military skill was only one component of becoming a good warrior, the other was having money to finance military campaigns. Because of these money troubles, as well as other political tensions, Henry's mentor, Sir Henry Percy, a powerful lord from the north of England who is generally known as Hotspur, grew so frustrated that he, along with other members of his family and the political nation, rebelled against King Henry IV. The younger Henry had the unenviable position of having to fight directly against the very man who had trained him as a military leader once the rebellion broke out. On the 21st of July, 1403, as part of the Northern Rebellion of Hotspur, King Henry IV and the young Prince Henry, along with their supporters, fought one of the bloodiest battles in England's history, the Battle of Shrewsbury. It proved an important victory for the king and ended the lives of Hotspur and other key members of the aristocracy. Henry played a key role during this battle. He also demonstrated profound courage after an arrow pierced his face just below his right eye and penetrated six inches into his skull. Most men would have collapsed following this incident, but Henry kept fighting. Afterwards, an English surgeon, John Bradmore, devised a way to not only extract the arrowhead from his skull, but also used a method whereby he stuffed wine and probes into the wound to facilitate the healing process. This kept any infection in the wound to a minimum, a major medical feat in an age before antibiotics. Nevertheless, while it had been hard won through an injury of this kind, Shrewsbury had taught young Henry the value of loyalty and he learned quickly how to effectively foster loyalty toward himself as the Prince of Wales and later as the King of England. In addition, he, like his father, clung to family and used their skills to help him govern rather than relying on characters such as Hotspur, who would rebel if the situation appeared propitious to do so. In fact, Henry's family provided him not only with three brothers of immense talent, but also his Beaufort uncles and the extended Lancastrian family and retainers. He would never have achieved all of the things which we will see he did during his brief reign without their efforts. Although Henry and his father had managed to put down one segment of the mass rebellions which had broken out across their dominions with victory at the Battle of Shrewsbury, the wider struggle was not over. 
The revolt of Owen Glyndwr was still a major problem in Wales and the western marches of England. It was here that Prince Henry focused his efforts from the mid-1400s onwards, while his father focused on quelling the remainder of the revolt in the north of England, notably by executing the Archbishop of York, Richard Scrope, for his role in the Hotspur Rebellion. In March 1405, Henry defeated Glendur in a clash at Grosmont and managed to capture one of the Welsh prince's sons. This was quickly followed by another victory at Usk in May 1405, the first major victory for English arms over the Welsh in a pitched battle since the war began. From this point onwards, the conflict turned in the English crown's favour. In 1407, Henry laid siege to Aberystwyth, which fell a year later. Even the French, who had allied themselves with the Welsh, pulled back, realising the tide was turning. In 1408, Henry turned to the Welsh stronghold Harlech. It proved a decisive encounter because not only was Glendower there, but also the remains of his family and one of his key English supporters, Edmund Mortimer, who was the rival to the Lancastrian claim to the throne of England. By 1409, Harlech had fallen and Mortimer had died during the siege. His wife and daughters died in captivity in London afterwards and his sons were already imprisoned. Glendower and one of his other sons fled into the mountains and was rarely ever heard from again. Through this experience, Henry became a person who could galvanize the king's men. He also developed novel approaches to solve old problems. For example, the hit-and-run method of his father that was used to control rebellion with limited funds clearly did not work. Henry chose instead to use the resources he had to retake key fortresses and hold them, then pushed forward in a new wave of capture and control, slowly and systematically constricting the enemy and its resources. It proved decidedly effective, and he gained respect of others in his father's court. Overall, Wales provided the theatre in which Prince Henry came of age as a military commander and leader in his youth. By the time the war in Wales was coming to an inexorable end, the prince was playing an ever more significant role in the governance of England. His father, King Henry IV, had been struck by a mysterious illness in 1405, one which became gradually more debilitating in the years that followed, with the king often suffering from seizures and periods when he was effectively bedridden. As his health declined, more and more responsibility was gradually given to the Prince of Wales. Young Henry attended his first meeting of the King's Council in December 1406 and would participate in these conferences and successive parliaments from that time forward. Also starting around this time, Henry IV's Chancellor, Thomas Arundel, the Archbishop of Canterbury, began to play a more substantial role in government affairs. He was particularly concerned to begin systematically addressing the financial shortfalls of the crown after years of financial mismanagement by Henry's father and the onerous burden of fighting multiple wars on different fronts. Arundel looked to other untapped resources in order to acquire greater revenue for the crown. Under Arundel and Prince Henry, the government began looking to use the extended royal family to address many of the problems confronted by the crown. Thus, Henry's brother, Thomas, was sent to Ireland. Although he was only 12 years of age, his presence there with royal advisers provided a clear symbol of the rejuvenation of royal authority across the Irish Sea. Similarly, Henry's third brother, John, was sent north to assist in stifling the rebellions on the Scottish borderlands towards the end of Henry IV's reign. John proved to be not only an excellent soldier, but a creative government administrator. It would be these people, the Beauforts, his brother, and key Lancastrian retainers to whom Henry V would turn to during his reign and even after his death to help him achieve his goals. 
As the years went by and Henry IV's illnesses showed no signs of improving, but rather continued to get worse, Henry was more and more presenting himself as a king in waiting. This was mirrored in his growing control over the government. For instance, Arundel was effectively forced out of his position within the government in 1409, and he and others were replaced by the prince's supporters. The prince's government, in essence, ruled England for much of the remaining years of Henry IV's reign. Their major efforts focused on reforming the crown's finances. Henry went after annuities to cut expenses, which his father always avoided because he thought it betrayed the trust of loyal supporters who were in financial distress. Henry also began to address the situation in France, where a civil war had effectively broken out as a consequence of Charles VI's increasing bouts of madness and psychological incapacity. Henry decided to support the claim of John the Fearless, the Duke of Burgundy, to try to seize power from Charles. Henry viewed this as advantageous, both because civil unrest in France was always advantageous to England, and because of the possibility that Henry would marry one of John's daughters. As such, by the late 1400s, Prince Henry was effectively running the English government. This effective usurpation of his position as king did not always sit well with Henry IV himself, and in 1411, during one of his periodic bouts of partial recovery from his health issues, he moved to reclaim control of the government and to remove his son and his followers from power. In November of that year, he suddenly reappeared on the political stage, playing a central role in the parliament which was underway. There were many reasons for this, but one of the most obvious was the differing attitude of father and son towards royal annuities. These were payments made annually by the crown to prominent subjects, effectively to reward them for their loyalty. The cost of them had been huge in the 1400s and contributed to the financial problems of the government. The prince had accordingly decided to begin cutting them back drastically in the late 1400s, but his father disagreed with this approach. He felt his son's approach was well-meaning, but naive, and would only serve to alienate the crown supporters and unleash a new wave of rebellions. Henry also did not find young Henry's choice in a French ally a good one. King Henry knew the players in the French court personally. He had stayed at the court during jousting tournaments as a youth and paid a visit on his return trip after his travels to the Holy Land. He had already taken the mark of the French court and backed the supporters of King Charles VI. He did not think it sensible to support the Burgundians, who were led by John the Fearless. As such, he believed young Henry had backed the wrong side in the civil war in France. As a result of these issues, King Henry entered Parliament on the 30th of November 1411 and calmly stated that he would no longer tolerate what he referred to as novelties in the government of the country. By this, he meant the attitudes towards French policy, the annuities and other measures, but he was also referring to growing rumours that he should abdicate the throne in favour of his son. Henry made it wholly clear that this was not going to happen. Instead, he asked those who had served his son and those who had served in his government to come forward, at which point he politely thanked them for their service and dismissed them. It took time for them to understand what had just happened, and when the realization hit, young Henry was furious. This action created extreme tensions within their father-son relationship, it did not help that the king reinstated Archbishop Arundel as Chancellor and placed Henry's brother Thomas as head of the king's council. Following Prince Henry's removal from the head of the government, his father changed a number of policies, notably towards France. In May 1412, the Treaty of Bourges was sealed. 
It acknowledged Henry IV in possession of the Duchy of Aquitaine and the west of France in exchange for England providing military support for the actions of the French king against the Burgundians. It was a stunning reversal of young Henry's plan. To make things even more tense between Henry and his brother Thomas, King Henry sent Thomas to Gascony to bolster the provisions specified in the treaty. For all intents and purposes, his father had shut Henry out of government and then completely reversed his French policy, among other matters. Henry eventually decided he had no option but to relent. After all, nobody knew in the early 1410s if his father would make a full recovery from his illnesses. If he did, he might well rule for another 20 or 30 years. Henry could not afford to be locked out of the political decision-making of the realm he would inherit one day for that long. Thus, after much soul-searching and worry, on the 29th of July, 1412, he entered his father's chamber and knelt before him. Henry begged forgiveness. Then he handed his father his dagger and said, My lord and father, my life is not so dear to me that I would live one day that I should be in your displeasure. I forgive you my death. King Henry immediately tossed away the dagger, embraced his son and cried. The reconciliation, however, was short-lived, not because the two quickly quarreled again, but because Henry IV's ill health resumed again within weeks. Early in 1413, he became seriously ill and was moved to Lambeth Palace across the River Thames from Westminster to try to recover. He did, and as his condition continued to deteriorate, he was moved about a month later to Westminster Abbey. There, he died in the Jerusalem chamber in the abbot's quarters on the 20th of March, 1413. In spite of their differences, Prince Henry had reconciled with his father before he died and received his blessing to inherit the throne. The funeral service was not held until June to give Thomas time to return from Gascony in western France. Then, King Henry IV was finally laid to rest on the 18th of June, 1413, in Trinity Chapel at Canterbury Cathedral. Although Henry may have experienced some youthful exuberance at the prospect of becoming King of England in his own right, the reality that he was about to be king changed him. As one story goes, on the night his father died, Henry left his family and headed towards St. Bennet's Chapel. He visited a hermit there by the name of William Annick. Henry stayed up all night talking with the hermit about morality and his fear of potential conflict among the various nobles since his father's hold on the throne had always been precarious. This episode is indicative of how his ascent to the kingship at 26 years of age changed Henry substantially. Rather than being an ambitious prince who wanted to assert himself in the political realm, he now had the burden of full responsibility for his subjects placed upon him. Thus it was that Henry was crowned King of England on the 9th of April 1413 at Westminster Abbey. The unusual spring blizzard that day made people wonder what it portended. Many saw it as a good omen that the new king would cleanse away the instability of the recent past and bring on a new age of moral kingship. This bolstered Henry's almost messianic mission to demonstrate divine approval of the Lancastrian family to rule over England and also of the crown's rightful claim to the French throne, which his great-grandfather had first pressed three-quarters of a century earlier. From the first days of his reign, Henry approached his task with purpose and energy. He quickly began addressing a number of outstanding issues remaining from his father's reign. For instance, he freed Edmund Mortimer and his brother Roger, who had claimed to be Richard II's true heirs and had posed a political risk in the 1400s. Edmund, in particular, had been the focus of a conspiracy to dethrone Henry's father 
and place Mortimer on the throne back in 1405. The Mortimers had been under guard ever since. Henry not only freed them, but made them both Knights of the Bath and returned their family estates to them. He then freed all of the Scottish prisoners, except the young King James I of Scotland, who had been captured by English pirates as he sailed to France in 1406 and had been held hostage ever since. He would be kept in England until well into the 1420s. Henry also reached out to other children whose parents had displeased the king. Edward, Duke of York, had his title restored, and his brother Richard was made Duke of Cambridge. He even freed Hotspur's son, also named Henry Percy, who would eventually have his family's estates returned to him as well. Finally, he ordered Richard II's body disinterred from his burial place in King's Langley Priory Church in Hertfordshire and had him reburied at Westminster Abbey next to his first wife, Anne of Bohemia, as he would have wished. The import of all of this was clear. It was a new reign, and the disunity and civil discord which admired his father's years as king were over. It was time for England to unite behind a new young monarch and revitalize the kingdom. One further outstanding issue which Henry had to contend with immediately was that of the Lollards. As we have seen, these had emerged during the reign of Richard II, but continued to pose a problem to the religious unity of England long after the death of their leader, John Wycliffe, in 1384. There had been various efforts to muzzle these dissenters under Henry IV, notably through the issuing of a statute entitled De Heretico Comburendo, which effectively proscribed the Lollards, while prominent Lollards such as William Sawtree and John Badby had been burned at the stake for refusing to recant their heretical beliefs. As king, Henry found himself again confronted with trying to get a heretic to recant. In this case, it was an old friend of his, Sir John Oldcastle, a long-standing ally of Henry and a trusted soldier during the Welsh conflict. Yet, he was an unabashed Lollard who was brought before Archbishop Arundel in September 1413 and declared a heretic. Henry intervened and gave Oldcastle a period of 40 days in which to reflect on his conscience and recant his heretical beliefs. This did not have the desired effect. Instead, Oldcastle escaped from the Tower of London. He then hatched a plot to kill the king, but the plot was exposed. Some of Oldcastle's supporters were killed or captured, but he managed to escape and remain at large until 1417, when he met his fate and was hanged and burned to death. It was a bitter pill to swallow for Henry, but as God's instrument on earth, he had no choice. The great papal schism also intruded on Henry's kingship. Beginning in the early 14th century, a run of seven successive popes had established themselves at Avignon in France, rather than residing at the Vatican in Rome. Then, from the mid-1370s, there had been two popes at once in Europe, one residing at Avignon and the other at Rome, but with both claiming to be the rightful head of the Roman Catholic Church. Efforts had been intermittently made to end this papal schism over the years, notably through a political and ecclesiastical council convened at the Italian city of Pisa in 1409. When this failed, the King of Hungary and Croatia and the King of the Romans, King Sigismund, who later became the Holy Roman Emperor, pressured the newly elected Pope John XXIII in 1413 to call for a council of prelates and government officials from all over Europe to meet in the German city of Constance in November 1414 to resolve the impasse. By Henry's calculations, in sending diplomats to this meeting, he could achieve two key things. First, he could prove his credentials as a pious king loyal to church and God by helping end the Great Schism, and secondly, 
It was an opportunity to build a relationship with one of the most powerful men in Europe, King Sigismund, and gain his support against the French. Ultimately, these efforts proved largely successful, as the Council of Constance sat for four years until 1418, at the end of which the Great Schism was brought to an end, and Pope Martin V was elected to rule over a reunited church. In addition, the teachings of John Wycliffe and the actions of the Lollards in England, as well as several heretical groups such as the Hussites in Bohemia, were condemned at the Council of Constance in 1415, providing Henry with the papal justification he needed to initiate a further series of crackdowns on the Lollards at home. From the beginning of his reign, Henry began planning for what he perceived to be the most important aspect of his duties as King of England, to regain his birthright in France. The foundations of the Hundred Years' War lay largely in the succession question plaguing France. By the early 14th century, France no longer had a direct royal line to the French throne. The three key claimants included the King of Navarre, who could claim the throne through his marriage to Jean, the daughter of Louis X, Philippe de Valois, cousin to Charles IV and nephew to Philippe IV, and Edward III of England, who was the grandson of Philippe IV through his mother, who was Philippe's daughter, Isabel. The title of king was given to Philippe de Valois. By the 1330s, Edward III decided he wanted to take what he felt was rightfully his and thus went to war with the French in 1337 to impose the claim of the English crown to also hold the French crown. Edward, Henry's great-grandfather, won stunning victories at Crecy in 1346 and Poitiers in 1356. At the last battle, King John of France was taken prisoner and ransomed for the enormous sum of three million gold coins. Yet, rather than press his luck and demand the French throne for himself, Edward III decided to negotiate with the French. The resulting Treaty of Bretigny of 1360 gave Edward full control over Guyenne, Gascony, Poitou, Limousin, the port city of Calais, and other lands in southwestern France. In exchange for these, he had to renounce his rights to Normandy, Anjou, and Maine. Those that followed as King of France did not hold to these terms, and much was lost over the intervening years due to French aggression and English royal ineptitude, leaving England with only the significant Gascony region in western France and the port city of Calais in the northeast of the country. Henry determined that he would follow his great-grandfather's playbook but would not settle for just control over these rich lands. He intended to demand the French crown as his birthright and felt that the recent destructive struggles which had occurred in France as a result of the mental instability of King Charles VI made the time propitious for him to press these claims. The first order of business to set the ball rolling towards this goal was to follow proper medieval protocol and negotiate with French officials to try to come to some form of settlement. Neither side entered these negotiations in good faith. For the French, their focus was on their own infighting and each side tried to gain Henry's support for their cause. Henry used this as a wedge to help propel negotiations in his favor. The French arrogantly believed that England was as weak as it had been under Richard II and Henry IV from its own internal problems and would never be able to bring the war to France in the same way that Edward III had been able to over a half a century earlier. Henry, for his part, had no intentions of caving into their demands, but he played along. During the summer of 1414, for example, Henry's diplomats presented an offer. He would renounce his claims to the French throne, 
if he was given much of the traditional lands his forebears and his father had held in northern and western France in the 12th century, along with additional territories in Flanders and Brittany. In addition, he requested the hand of Charles VI's daughter Catherine, along with a dowry of two million crowns. The French lamely offered a dowry of 600,000 crowns along with Aquitaine, which, of course, the English turned down. Negotiations continued like this for months. Meanwhile, Henry was gradually initiating his plans for an invasion of France. From the very moment he became King of England, Henry had begun overseeing the strengthening of the English army and navy with the goal of intervening in France. Unlike his father, Henry was not, with the exception of the unrest provoked by Sir John Oldcastle, plagued by a wave of rebellions at the outset of his reign. As such, he was free to begin diverting resources towards a resumption of the Hundred Years' War in France. First, he ordered the building of both a strong land army to operate on the continent and a navy to transport this army across the English Channel and to protect key ports for the disembarking of troops and to ensure strong resupply and communication channels. He then had his officials foster a national industry to create tens of thousands of arrows, lances, armor, and even cannons. In tandem, he spent much of 1414 and 1415 building alliances with key European players, such as requesting ships from Flanders. He negotiated a truce with Spanish traders, who liked to raid English merchant ships and disrupt trade in the English Channel, and a similar truce with Brittany. But Henry's greatest success was in reaching an agreement with John the Fearless, the Duke of Burgundy, that he would not come to Charles VI's aid when Henry invaded France. In addition to these efforts, he continued to support King Sigismund's work at the Council of Constance, which nominally gained him support among the German principalities. While making these logistical and diplomatic preparations, Henry also ensured that England and Wales would be secure while he absented himself in France. To do this, he ordered extensive repairs and renovations to be carried out of existing castles and strongholds and the construction of new fortifications along the coasts, especially the southern ports and along the Welsh and Scottish borderlands. He also refused to release King James I of Scotland, using his captivity to guarantee peace with the Scots and ensure that they would not ally with the French once the war resumed. All of this took money, and Henry not only used traditional means of support, such as rents from royal estates and court fees and fines, but also aggressively milked trade subsidies and duties to bring in extra revenue. While he reviewed his father's sacred cow annuities, he only continued them if he could gain something in return from the recipients. Otherwise, he pulled that support. He also requested donations or loans from supporters who generously supplied the bulk of his resources. Like any modern fundraising effort, Henry's team worked the people of England for these contributions in such a way that just about everyone in England felt that they had a critical role to play in the war effort. This helped to build staunch support for the king and his goals that would last long after Henry died. What is not often discussed by historians is the fact that Henry used the crown jewels and other treasures not only as collateral for these loans, but also pawned some of these materials, including the royal crown. Although many people, both modern and contemporary, were critical of the poor money management of Henry IV, his son incurred a huge debt just for this first campaign to France. The crisis for money would only grow as Henry pushed deeper into France to claim the French throne. Many of the crown's treasures were never returned to the royal house because it took so long for the next generation to pay off his war debts.
Despite the severity of these fundraising measures, they were doubtlessly effective. By 1415, Henry felt he was ready to go to France. Yet, God wanted Henry to wait, or so he thought. He had planned to leave in early summer, but the delay of the arrival of French envoys to continue negotiations postponed his departure. Once they had left, he mustered the troops and was ready to sail on the 1st of August, only to be informed that some key players, such as Richard, Earl of Cambridge, Lord Henry Scrope, Sir Thomas Grey, and Sir Robert Umfreville were plotting to kill the King and put Edmund Mortimer, Earl of March, on the throne. Mortimer, who had played along with the plotters, told the King. Of course, Henry could not leave this conspiracy, which is known to posterity as the Southampton Plot, unaddressed. The guilty parties were rounded up, and Grey and Scrope were tried with Thomas, Henry's brother, presiding over the trials. Both were found guilty and quickly executed. Henry then did something surprising. He immediately ordered the confiscation and sale of Scrope's property. It was an illegal act, but the underlying motivation could have been his desperate need for money. This done, Henry completed his will, made his brother, John, Duke of Bedford, his lieutenant in England, and headed for France on what would become one of the most infamous military campaigns in English and European history. On the 11th of August, 1415, Henry finally boarded his flagship, the Trinity Royal, and sailed to France. Of course, the French had known for quite some time that an invasion was likely, However, based upon past performance, they did not have much concern about what would be heading their way. Between the bouts of insanity of their king, Charles VI, and the infighting among royal family members, the most significant question became who would lead the defense of the country against the invaders. Nominally, Charles d'Abre, a career soldier, was made constable of France and Jean Le Maigre, also known as Marshal Bouquicot, one of France's greatest military fighters, was appointed Captain General. More importantly, would the heir apparent, the Dauphin Louis, lead the army? For the French, Henry's 1415 assault would prove a perfect storm which led to a political and military disaster. Henry had planned to attack Arfleur in the north of France first because of its strategic location near the mouth of the River Seine. He first stopped at Chef de Caux on the 13th of August as a cautionary measure. There appeared to be no resistance. Even so, he ordered no one to leave the ships until a search party scouted the region, including the situation at Arfleur. The message which arrived back was that it was safe to go ahead. They moved to Arfleur and began to disembark, which took three days. Salt marshes, an estuary, and strong walls protected the town of Arfleur. Once settled, Henry ordered his brother Thomas to move his forces around to the other side of the town to camp on the hillside overlooking the region. Having surrounded the town, Henry followed medieval military procedure rooted in the rules set down in the Book of Deuteronomy, verse 10, to talk with the town's leaders and offer them the choice to choose peace over bloodshed. They rejected the English calls for peace. Thus, the siege of Arfleur began with heavy bombardment and efforts made to cut off all supplies and communications into or out of the town. As the siege dragged on for weeks, the constant bombardment and beginnings of starvation made the siege difficult for the townspeople. To make matters worse, starting late in the second week or early in the third week of the siege, dysentery began to impact on the forces of both sides. The townspeople prayed for relief and even managed to get letters out requesting help from the French forces. But by the third week of September, after a brief truce to permit one last official attempt to call for help, it had become clear to those in Arfleur that no one was coming to relieve them. They were on their own. On the 23rd of September, Henry and his forces finally entered the town of Arfleur. 
He headed straight to the Church of St. Michael and prayed, grateful for his victory. The young king also took the opportunity to reiterate to his troops their code of conduct for military operations in France. Churches and religious buildings were not to be pillaged. Clergy and women were not to be harmed unless they were clearly hostile, and rape was prohibited. Non-combatants within the English armed forces were similarly required to follow military rules, including obeying all orders from military officers. All foraging expeditions had to be authorized and no buildings were to be pillaged or burned unless explicit commands to that effect had been received. Rules about taking of hostages proved strict as well. Henry's intent for all of these rules was to build trust among the French people. He wanted them to see that he cared for his people as their true king and the new ruler of France. But there were also stringent expectations of his new subjects. The people of Varfleur, for instance, were given an ultimatum. Anyone who swore allegiance to him could remain and help rebuild the town. Those wealthy citizens who refused to swear loyalty would be ransomed, while all poor, sick women and children were permitted to take all they could carry and then were escorted towards the French army. At the same time, all those within the English military who were sick or injured were sent back to England, including Henry's brother Thomas, who had fallen ill with dysentery. On the 5th of October 1415, Henry held a military council to determine what his next move would be. Many of his advisers wanted to return home, having scored a substantial success in conquering Arfleur. Yet, Henry believed God wanted him to continue. So, on the 8th of October, the English army broke camp at Arfleur and headed for Calais. Henry left Thomas Beaufort, Earl of Dorset, at Arfleur to hold the town with about 100 soldiers and 900 archers, along with support personnel. He also ordered the English fleet to patrol the coastline and estuary of the River Seine. Henry had suffered losses. Historians debate how many, but his forces had been depleted. The best guess is Henry left England with roughly 12,000 fighting men plus support personnel. After Arfleur, he had roughly 10,000 fighters left. Having then left about 1,200 men to hold Arfleur, he was returning to Calais with a total force of not much more than 9,000, along with support personnel. Henry's actions followed Edward III's playbook. His goal was to cross the Somme River at an old Roman ford near Blanchetac. The French, knowing that history, did everything they could to stop him from crossing. They destroyed this ford and smashed other bridges and causeways all down the river, forcing Henry deeper into French territory and away from his goal of Calais. Henry also had the challenge of maintaining discipline, especially after food supplies began to run low. While some villagers along the way submitted to Henry and offered food, others did not, accompanied by a few skirmishes. Then luck finally came their way. At Nail, one of the villagers told them about an unguarded ford. Henry finally had a way to cross the Somme, which they did on the 19th of October near Bethencourt. From here, the French seemed to herd the English into their chosen location for battle. Yet, it would all prove a disaster for the French. On the night of the 24th of October, Henry V and his English forces settled in for the night outside of the village of Messoncelle. The French spread out near the town of Tramacourt and began sending appeals out to the local nobility and gentry to send whatever military support they could. The following day, one of the most significant battles in English military history would be fought. It was named for a small town near the French forces, Agincourt. The battle would finally be joined between the English and French the following day, the 25th of October 1415, after days of the two sides shadowing each other. Strangely, 
The French selected a battlefield that had been ploughed and had grain sowed in it. It was about a mile in length with woods on either side. And rather than provide room for the vast numbers of French, of which there were around 12,000 troops, the shape of the field would force them into a tight squeeze before meeting the English. Fortuitously for Henry, it rained during the night, turning the field into a plain of sticky mud. Early the next morning, Henry performed his devotionals, ordered the archers to spike the field with stakes as a defense against a cavalry charge, and formed the men up into three groups called battles. They would move as one, with Henry commanding the center battle, dressed to attract the attention of the enemy. The French also formed up, but controversy continued to reign over who was the true leader. Nominally, the Dauphin Louis commanded. Heralds were sent to a convocation before the battle so formal medieval niceties could be adhered to, and then they waited, neither side wanting to start the battle. Finally, Henry had enough. He gave the command to begin, startling the French with a cloud of arrows that filled the sky. The French responded with an ill-prepared cavalry charge, but since the English held up just past the narrowest part of the field, they were channeled into the stakes and another hailstorm of arrows. The sticky mud made quick maneuvers impossible, and this, combined with the French being confined to a narrow area and the devastating impact of wave after wave of arrows unleashed by the English longbows, was what would make Agincourt such a spectacular victory. In the period that followed, terrified Frenchmen and horses tried to flee, only to be trampled by the next onslaught of soldiers, cavalry, and English arrows. Bodies piled up, making it hard to move. Then the French began to see how numbers can be a disadvantage when hand-to-hand -hand combat started. They were so thick that they could not move to swing their swords. Slipping and sliding in the mud only exacerbated the situation. Hundreds died in the melee or were crushed. At one point, Henry's brother Humphrey was injured and fell to the ground. Henry leapt in and covered his brother against his assailant until he could be dragged away to safety. After hours of fighting, there was a pause to permit the French to regroup after the English had demolished two of their battles. The hostilities had not ended, or had they? Henry realized that the French had more men ready to charge in, but would they use them? He assumed it was only a matter of time. In this moment, Henry did something that not only violated the medieval rules of war, but his own rules of conduct set forth for his army. In the medieval world, unarmed prisoners, especially nobles who could be ransomed, were not to be killed. However, Henry lacked the men to watch these prisoners and feared they might join the fight, making it a two-pronged battle, so he gave the ignoble order to massacre all of the prisoners. Despite this precaution, or perhaps because of it, the renewed charge which he feared did not happen. There was one final French cavalry charge with the English archers responding with a cloud of arrows. Then, realizing further engagement would almost certainly only lead to more carnage, the French withdrew from the field. Only hours before, Henry and his army faced certain defeat, but with military skill, the technological superiority of the English longbow, and more than a little luck in terms of the positioning of the battle, an astonishing victory had been won by Henry over the French. The Battle of Agincourt soon became the stuff of legend. For the French, this was an unmitigated disaster with up to 7,000 troops and auxiliaries dead and injured. Accusations of blame flew at anyone and anything to try to explain how this could have happened. During the backbiting, John the Fearless tried to take advantage of the weakened French government and made an effort to seize Paris. For the English, they gathered their injured and made a slow three-day journey to Calais. The wounded were sent to England immediately, 
but Henry remained in Calais until the 16th of November 1415. Thus, it was not until the 23rd of November that he made his triumphant parade through London, cheered on by joyous citizens. By that time, Henry was already planning his next foray into France. The victory at Agincourt and the disarray which it had created across France had opened up the possibility of an English conquest of Paris itself, and that Edward III's dream of uniting the kingdoms of England and France under one monarch could finally be achieved by his great-grandson. However, Henry was unable to follow up the campaign of 1415 with a crushing blow in 1416. First, he had to deal with the presence of Genovese ships in the English Channel who were allied with France and were determined to block English supply lines between England and Calais and Arfleur. Then, Henry's return to France was delayed by the arrival of King Sigismund to England on the 3rd of May 1416 to negotiate for support of his efforts at the Council of Constance. In England, Henry received him warmly and treated him to the best of England. He also made Sigismund a Knight of the Garter. Then, on the 15th of August 1416, they agreed the Treaty of Canterbury, a mutually beneficial trade and military agreement. Sigismund subsequently failed to uphold his end of this, but what the treaty did do was lend further legitimacy to Henry's claim to the French throne, as, under the terms of the treaty, Sigismund declared his support. To build on this diplomatic success, Henry reaffirmed support from other quarters, including the Castilians. He even traveled to Calais to negotiate with John the Fearless to gain his support for his claim to the French throne. Henry also addressed the financial situation in England in order to fund his military needs. With all of this undertaken, he then finally returned to France in August 1417. Having landed at Torque, he began his renewed efforts by moving to take Caen in the north of the country. This siege went in similar fashion as Arfleur, with the town surrendering on the 20th of September 1417. Soon after, the towns of Bayeux and Lisieux surrendered, and over the next few weeks, additional towns capitulated to Henry. Throughout late 1417 and early 1418, he began solidifying his control over northern France, with his brother Humphrey moving to seize the western side of Normandy in February 1418. Yet, the port city of Cherbourg refused to fall, and it took a five-month siege to finally defeat its defenders. Finally, that summer, on the 29th of July, Henry began his siege of Rouen, the capital of Normandy. It was a long, deadly affair. In December, in desperation, the Rouen townspeople expelled their starving poor, including old men, women, and children. Henry refused to show mercy by feeding them, declaring, I did not put them there, and many died. Rouen opened its gates in defeat on the 19th of January 1419. Henry had successfully conquered Normandy, the duchy which his ancestors had once come from to conquer England in the mid-11th century. Perhaps his dream of fulfilling Edward III's goal of conquering France was not as fantastical an ambition as many might have believed. Concern was certainly growing amongst the French about Henry's successes. Thus, a meeting was called for May 1419 in Melun, where the French would meet with Henry and his emissaries. Both King Charles VI and John the Fearless attended. It was the first time Henry met the woman he had sought to be his bride, Catherine. Henry now reiterated his desire to have her hand in marriage thus tying his line to that of the French monarchy, and also that he would hold all of the lands promised under the terms of the Treaty of Bretigny, which Edward III had concluded over half a century earlier. This 
would effectively have restored England to possession of much of northern and western France. The only concession Henry would offer was that he might renounce his right to the French crown if he received everything else. John the Fearless remained silent during these negotiations and then secretly decided to betray his agreement with Henry by allying himself with the Dauphin Charles, the future King Charles VII. Thus, while both sides had now made their negotiating position clear, little tangible was achieved by the meeting at Melun. Henry's response was swift. On the 29th of July, he sent some of his army to attack Pontoise, John the Fearless's headquarters. On the 3rd of August, the army of Henry's brother Thomas had reached Saint-Denis near Paris and continued to move forward, threatening Paris itself. While this was going on, a meeting was set between the Dauphin and John. In a rare, decisive moment, the Dauphin's servants murdered John. This event changed the political dynamics considerably. On the 27th of September, Henry met with the King of France and his supporters only. Henry demanded the French throne and Catherine without a dowry. He insisted that it would be ruled as two separate kingdoms, but their children would inherit the French throne by birthright. He would permit Charles VI to remain on the throne until his death. Stunningly, the French agreed. Consequently, on the 21st of May 1420, the Treaty of Troyes was officially sealed, making Henry Regent of France. On the 2nd of June 1420, he then married Catherine of France at Troyes in a simple wedding. It seemed that Henry had finally conquered France over 80 years after his great-grandfather had initiated the Hundred Years' War in an effort to do so. He must have felt that the task was largely complete when he entered Paris on the 1st of December 1420 for the first time in triumph. He remained there to celebrate Christmas, yet all was not well. Henry still had some mopping up to do because a few cities refused to surrender and the Dauphin Charles continued to ferment trouble. In England, people had grown tired of the war and its expense. It was time to return to England to introduce his new bride. He left his brother Thomas as his lieutenant in France. He made his way back to the coast and sailed to England arriving in Dover on the 2nd of February 1421. Although Henry had been gone for three years, the kingdom had been in the capable hands of Bishop Henry Beaufort and then the Bishop of Durham, Thomas Langley. Three weeks after their arrival, Catherine was crowned Queen of England at Westminster Abbey. They then set out on a grand tour to show Catherine England. The tour also served as a fundraiser for his military needs in France. Yet, as Henry soon discovered, it was proving more and more difficult to continue raising large financial subsidies in England, the same problem which had eventually thwarted his great-grandfather in his efforts to conquer France. Fundraising proved harder than before. Then, on the 21st of March, 1421, Henry received shocking news. Thomas, as his acting lieutenant in France, had engaged the Dauphin Charles at the Battle of vieilles bourget Overly eager to claim a stunning victory of his own, Thomas had foolishly raced into battle without properly placing his troops in formation. He was killed, several English officers were taken prisoner, and a formidable victory was won by the Dauphin and the French. This victory bolstered the confidence of the Dauphin and proved that the English were not invincible. For Henry, it was a disastrous reversal. However, he did not return immediately to France as Catherine was pregnant. Eventually, on the 9th of June 1421, Henry sailed from Dover for France. There, things declined even further. The Duke of Brittany had signed a treaty with the Dauphin, while the young Duke of Burgundy 
John the Fearless's son, was also beginning to have second thoughts about his alliance with the English. Once in France, Henry set to work. He first addressed the situation at Dreux, which capitulated after about four weeks. He then headed to Chartres to address the siege there. Upon his arrival, the Dauphin pulled back, ending the siege, and he retreated to Tours. Henry returned to Paris and attacked sites still loyal to the Dauphin nearby. He began his siege on Meur and Marche in October. The weather was miserable. Dysentery and fever ravaged the troops. Morale was low. The only good news Henry received was the announcement of the birth of his son in December. He was christened Henry like his father and grandfather. The town of Meur fell in March 1422 and Marche in May. Compagne surrendered soon after. As had been the case since 1415, Henry's personal presence and military leadership in France brought victory after victory. Despite these victories, all was not well. Henry was clearly ill during his latest campaign on the continent, as, with so many other royal illnesses of the time, it is difficult to know precisely what the malady was, but it seems likely that he was suffering from dysentery. The situation was serious enough by the spring of 1422 that Queen Catherine left England to be with the king, arriving to France in May. There, she witnessed the further decline of her husband. On the 26th of August, 1422, the situation was so drastic that Henry reviewed his will and added a codicil to address the care of his son and heir, the infant Henry, who was still short of his first birthday. He would soon be king as King Henry VI of England, for his father died in France at Chateau de Vincennes on the 31st of August 1422. Henry's body was taken through France in commemoration and then sent to England. He was buried at Westminster Abbey on the 7th of November, 1422. Following Henry's death, a regency government was established to rule England on behalf of his infant son. This included figures such as Bishop Henry Beaufort, the Duke of Exeter, and Chancellor Thomas Langley, while Henry's widow, Queen Catherine, would also play a prominent role over the next several decades as a fierce advocate for her son. But there was trouble ahead. A Regency government could never sustain the kind of military campaigning which Henry V had been able to in the 1410s and early 1420s in France. Moreover, just weeks after Henry's own death, the Dauphin, Charles, succeeded to the throne of France as King Charles VII. In the years that followed, as England suffered from a weak minority government, France was strengthened by Charles' effective kingship and the appearance of Joan of Arc as a heroine of the French side in the war in the late 1420s. Then, when Henry VI finally came of age, he proved to be mentally unstable. Thus, England faced major political crises from the 1440s onwards. All of this saw the English war effort collapse in France. In 1451, the city of Bordeaux, the capital of the English presence in Gascony, fell to Charles VII's armies, and following the Battle of Castillon in 1453, England was expelled from all its territories in France, other than the town of Calais and its hinterland. While this would remain in English hands until the 1550s, 1453 is typically viewed as marking the end of the Hundred Years' War. Moreover, as Henry VI's mental collapse worsened in the 1450s, England itself was plunged into civil war the famed Wars of the Roses for the next 30 years. Henry V is one of England's most lionized kings. Much of that reputation rests on the spectacular English victory at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415 and the fact that English arms and political power in France peaked in the years that followed. 
There is no doubting that Henry was a dynamic king and an effective military campaigner, and that this allowed him to succeed in this way. But if Henry succeeded in this way in France, it was to a large extent owing to the French being massively divided owing to the psychological frailty of their long-reigning king, Charles VI. It was owing to Charles's incapacity as king and the civil war which it provoked in France in the 1400s that Henry was able to succeed so spectacularly there between 1415 and 1422. When the tables were reversed thereafter, the war flipped in France's favor again. What is perhaps most striking is that Henry faced the same issues which his great-grandfather, Edward III, had namely the inability of the English government to pay for a sustained war against France. Had he lived longer, it seems likely that Henry would have succeeded where the regency government for his son failed. In this sense, Henry's legacy largely rests on his premature death. What do you think of Henry V? Does his victory at Agincourt make him England's greatest warrior king? Or was his victory against the French a carbon copy of the tactics used by Edward III and the Black Prince? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.